to why. Um, can you describe what it is? And well, to why the word yes. is a word in the language of the Panan people of Borneo, mm -hmm. who we spend most of our time with, I've just been talking about, and um, in the film. And, um, and there is it's a word that um, <clears throat> we don't really have a very good way of translating into our language very clearly, because culturally we don't quite get what it is that they're on about, I think. Um, and the, that word, I can't exactly describe what it is, but I can tell you a few occasions when they use it. So they would say, um, we've got them in the, in the film actually saying like, I feel to why for this forest, because this forest, when I'm here in the fruiting season, it's like being held like a mother does her child. You feel nourished and you feel safe and you feel supported and you trust. Mm -hmm. So there's an element of that. But then they also say like to why um, there's no to why in the destroyed forest. Right. Um, and there's also they like I feel to why for something it reminds me of some time when we were all together and happy. So there's like a nostalgia there. There's a <laughs> feeling of safeness and being nurtured. And so there's a whole there's a whole package. Yeah. And that is all conjured up in that one word. And the reason that I chose the word um, as the title for the film is because our film is a little bit about the connection to nature. Yeah. And what is that? Is that just a metaphor or a poetic way of describing being physically close to nature? Yeah. Or is there something else? Is there something truly that is connecting us? And what, what is that about? And how might the Penan, for example, be perceiving the world? Is that different? Are they experiencing their relationship with each other and the environment in a different way to how we are? And how do we go about understanding what that might be? What's their sense of identity of how they see themselves in relationship with that which is around them? And so we dive into that a bit, which is, of course, quite a complex thing to make a film about and quite a complex thing to, to understand, except that today we are beginning to understand that more. You know, we are with the zeitgeist and there's more and more yoga studios and people learning to meditate and all the rest of it. And the talk of connection, talk of oneness, talk of this, uh, this sort of other realm, this other way of feeling is, is, is growing, you know, so it feels like a good time to have that sort of conversation. It's a strong understanding that if we alienate ourselves from nature, we sort of alienate ourselves from our own nature. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and what is nature, you know, are we separate from nature or are we also nature, you know, it's like what we, of course, it depends on the language and the prism, but, you know, the, the, the Panan don't see themselves in any way as separate from that which is around them. Yeah. And I, and also with their group either. I mean, like I think that um, I ask any one of those people who they are, and they will say, "I am here in this place." You know that they, they, their sense of identity is not only the individual sense of identity that we get and understand, but also a sense of identity that is very much linked to people and location and the other species in that location too. So all of that is like that's their understanding of me is the the we. And the me kind of merge, yeah. and it's and it's really interesting to try and get your head around that. Um, but I, I I really believe that. You know, I think I used to say this, and I, I I say this after having been there. So I didn't try it when I was there. Maybe I should go back. Um, but I truly believe that if I took any one of those people from the Penan and took them to one side and said, "What is your own deep desire for your own?" wishes for the future, your own personal, what do you want for the future? I think they would all give me a very similar answer. And, and, it's, and I think I, I can say that because I genuinely believe their own deepest desire is that this thing that they have with, this, with these other people in this place just continue. And that desire transcends any individual desire for all the things that we are like constantly searching for. I want this and I want that. They're, they're like, I, yeah, that would be great, but not if that interrupts with this amazing thing that we've got going on here, going forwards for our kids to have. Yeah. And that's a true wisdom yeah. in my understanding. That's like that. That's an ethic that transcends any ethic that I see talked about in any of our courts or legal or, or you know, or governments or anything. It's like that's an ethic that takes into account all people and species and environment for the future. And, it's not just a happenstance that they happen to be living in a low impact way. It's a, it's a feeling that they have, that they want. That's amazing. Living in a low, low impact way with a very light 
footprint mm. has kind of worked against them slightly, hasn't it, recently, because they haven't been able to prove, and the irony is their, their legal kind of rights where they live. And it's very true. It's a really sad, sad irony. You know, and there's a bit of me that wonders whether Malaysian law is kind of written with that in mind, knowing that or, or not. But the, the truth of the matter is that the, the few indigenous groups who are still nomadic are living in the way that the Penan do, um, have such a light impact on the land that they, it's very hard for them to actually show that they've even been there. And so when it comes to them trying to petition the government to get, to get their, a reserve for them, um, the government's going, well, you know, you don't fit with our criteria. We need proof. Yeah. And so that's meant that <clears throat> most of those groups haven't had any legal standing when the loggers come in and start taking their forest. And that, as you can imagine, they're the people who've been there longest. Yeah. You know, all the other groups have come in in the second wave of, of uh, migration out of Africa or whatever. They're the ones who were there first and they're the ones who've, you know, who, who have this way that is so special and so beautiful and yet they, they have no claim to their, to their um, ancestral home and that's really tragic. A young, a younger Bruce Parry, when you first went there, mm. would you have been, you know, would you have been sort of tuned in as much? I mean, were you quite a lot different going back? Yeah, time? yeah, without question. You know, it was after, it was during the making of the Tribe series that, um, you know, as I said earlier, like I was in such a, I was surfing this wave of stimulation overload, yeah. and then I went off. And I did a series uh, going crossing Greenland, pretending to be Captain Scott of all things. And I went from that sort of like stimulation overload suddenly into this white flat expanse every day for like three months of stepping out of my tent and having no stimulation at all. Like literally like no trees, no foliage, no hills, nothing, just white expanse forever. And it was like going cold turkey. Yeah. And... Um, that was really hard. I hadn't learned to meditate. I didn't know about med so the my question, my rabbiting of mind, mind. was, was yeah. fully out of control, and it was not a pleasant experience. Actually, I didn't enjoy the the going from one extreme to the other. I found it really difficult, and so that was the first inkling, in a way, that I was I, I needed to, to to change. Actually, it wasn't a pleasant experience for me. So I. So that's when later on, I mean, that's not the main catalyst, but later on when I learned, did learn to meditate, yeah. I was like, oh my God. And then finally, when I went to do the, the Arctic series, having learned to meditate and like calm down this like rampaging sort of addiction to what's next, what's next, um, I was suddenly able to be in these places in a very different way. You know, so I remember going across, I was with some reindeer herders in Siberia sitting on a sledge and just looking around and going, oh my God, I'm fully present now and experiencing this in a way that all of my trips before, I was never really fully present in the way that I am now. And that, I mean, that's a tragedy to actually say that to the world. All these places that I got said, and I was never really fully present. I was always kind of like, what's next? And... And so that, in that sense, yes, I totally have, have changed when I went back. It's like I was much more capable of, of being there, you know.